Hello, church. We're glad you're joining us today. Hey, let us know you're out there and um, in the comment section, drop us your name or a prayer request. We'd love to hear from you. Enjoy the message. Um, we are going to jump right into the series in just a minute, but if you were here last week, we announced that we have Two new people stepping into our shepherd team. Our shepherd team is our leadership core. They are the people that help guide um, and direct the church and where we're going uh, spiritually, vision-wise, um, making sure that we're kind of staying within the parameters of our bylaws and our doctrinal, doctrinal statements, those kinds of things. So uh, last week we announced them. The two individuals are Bruce Gladwin and Chad Brown. And uh, last week, Bruce, we showed his video testimony. This week, I'd like to see you to see Chad's video testimony. So check out Chad's testimony. I grew up in a household that was always focused on God. My parents raised me with the expectation that I would always be a Christian. So that was always the plan. I gave my, I gave my life to Christ around the age of 12. And it just happened to be that it was a little bit before Father's Day. And it was on Father's Day that my dad baptized me. That was just coincidental. I found that out later on. It was pretty special to him, and, and these days it's special to me. That's uh, that's something that's always meant a lot to me. As I got older, I gave my life to Christ, but then there was a time in there when my faith was more my parents' faith, which was a great faith. It was a faith that I was brought up in, a faith that put God first, a faith that was very strong. But as I got older, I started to develop my own faith that was separate from my parents' faith, which is what they want, which is what we should all want. And that development of that faith comes at different ages for different people. For me, it came when I had children. Uh, when, my, when my first son was born, uh, it was at that time I started to really understand a lot of the things that are in the Scripture. When we talk about God being our Father, uh, that's when I started to really get it. So the thing that I still struggle with in my faith is I believe in God. I intellectually l l know that there's a God that loves me, and I know that His Son died on the cross for my sins and that I'm saved. But sometimes I still struggle with when I'm in the storm, I think maybe this isn't the time that maybe that it's going to work out. And, and I know that it, that it always has and that God always blesses us. The thing that I still struggle with is sometimes in the, in the storm, I might be the kind of guy that would want to wake Jesus up and hand him a bucket of water and tell him to start bailing. And invariably, and this is how great our God is, He comes through for me regardless. And I, that's a lesson that I've had to learn over and over and we'll probably continue to learn but i feel like i'm getting a lot better with it so many people are trying to wait to get their life in order or, or, or wonder whether they are good enough well let, let me tell you you're not well, none of us are i'm not come on in with us let's all work on it together that's the beauty of the message that's the thing that's so simple you don't have to be perfect he is, He was, He always will be, and you will be saved through His grace that's provided through His blood. So if you're thinking about it, stop thinking about it. Come on with us. So that's a little bit about me and my faith background, and thank you for taking the time to listen, listen to me today. I look forward to working with you, and I look forward to going through great times and struggles together. I'll see you at the church. All right. Well, hey, um, 
encourage you to take some time to meet Chad and Bruce, um, both of them just great guys. Uh, as we said last week, they are not officially on as shepherds. There will be a six-month period for people to bring forward any reason why we maybe should not uh, or should reconsider. Um, there will be a six-month period before we lay hands on them and accept them as shepherds. So during that six months, uh, opportunity to get to know them and, and voice your thoughts or opinions if you don't already know them. All right. Well, hey, if we haven't met, my name is Shane, and I'm the lead pastor here at MVF Church, and I have the privilege of sharing God's Word with you, um, usually on a weekly basis. <laughs> um, this uh, this last week, I'm going to be, you know, just kind of tell you about my weekend. I got a I got an email from Spud or that uh, asking me if I could preach. Uh, it was on Thanksgiving Day because I had him scheduled to preach today and I had family in town and so I was like oh yeah okay but he had a he he had a death in the family and so he needed to be out of town um he he's his him, he and his family have been kind of going through some tough stuff they've had two deaths in the family actually in the last like five or six uh, days so please be in prayer for them and the family as they're uh, just kind of struggling through that and so they ended up leaving town yesterday um but i i had a busy weekend i don't know if anyone had a good thanksgiving i hope you all had a really good thanksgiving i know for some of you that thanksgiving was a Hey, we kind of moved away from family, and we just kind of had a little chill time with no family besides us, and that was great. And we've never had, we've always had these chaos Thanksgivings, and some of you were inviting the chaos, and I was the family that was inviting the chaos. We had um, both my brothers and my sister came in to town, and my stepmom, and we all um, hung out, and their kids, so with the, all of us, I think there was about 28 of us, 29, something like that, um, and it was at our house. We literally, we cooked no less than four turkeys, um, uh, mainly because we wanted to experiment, because I was like, let's do a fried turkey, but then I realized I'd never done a fried turkey, so I better not mess that up, so let's do a, a, let's do a smoked turkey, because I love smoke, smoking meat, let's do a smoked turkey. Not everyone likes smoked turkey, though, so we better do a uh, roasted turkey as well, um, uh, and then I messed up the smoked turkey a little bit, so I thought, well, let's do another one. So anyway, so it just it, it was a little chaos. We uh, had everyone leave the house yesterday morning, and uh, my wife and I spent the day trying to clean and recover. Because I'm also the oldest of those siblings by quite a bit. I'm 17 years older than my sister and nine years older than my twin brothers. And I'm I, I'm just keeping up kills me every single time, you know, playing pickleball and going on hikes and family wrestling matches in the living room eventually just kind of wear me out. So <laughs> anyway, that was my weekend. Hopefully you had a good Thanksgiving weekend <clears throat> um, and uh, ready for the next holiday. Getting ready, right? How many of you put away your Thanksgiving stuff, and as you're putting that away, you're bringing in the Christmas stuff. Any, right? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, how many of you are like, we didn't have Thanksgiving in my house, so I've had Christmas up for two weeks already. Any <laughs> any of you? A few? No one? Really? I've, I've talked to people that that's the deal. They've got it up because they're like, wasn't at my house, so I just went right into Christmas. So, um, all right. Well, we are talking about God is, and we're kind of just talking about Different attributes of God. Who is God? You know, as Christ followers, we should do our very best to, to know God, try to understand God. Um, it's one thing to just believe that there is a God. It's another thing to kind of try to do our best to wrap our minds around and understand who this God is of the Bible and, and how that applies to us. Because quite frankly, I think a lot of the reasons people lose faith in God is because they really never took the time to try to understand who God is. God was always in their head of just kind of whatever they painted God out to be. And when God didn't follow through the way they felt he should follow through, the way, the way it made sense to them of the God they painted in their head, well, well, now I don't believe in that God. But what I've tried to get across in this whole series is that if you can really truly put God in a box, if you can say, this is who God is, then that is not a God worth worshiping anyway. Because you now are bigger than him. God is bigger than any of our boxes. And we're never fully going to understand him. And even as we cover these topics, we're scratching the surface of them. 
and and we're beginning to understand them. So you're never going to walk out on, as we go through one of these and kind of go, wow, I fully grasp it. Hopefully, if anything, you kind of go, wow, that's a part of God that I don't really think about much. I maybe haven't put a lot of thought into. I'd love to think more on that. I'd love to understand who God is at that level a little bit more. And I, yet I still understand that I'll probably never completely get that. Okay, that that really should be our mindset and our attitude and our heart with God. The moment you sit back and you kind of go, I studied it, I've figured it out, I know exactly who God is. The moment is, first of all, you should be teaching everyone, not just this church. You should be teaching everyone, and chances are you're wrong. <laughs> so right, so so that that's God is just bigger than what we're ever going to imagine. But what I want us to see today. We've talked about his holiness. We've talked about his greatness. We've talked about that he is the creator. He's the creating God. Today, I want us to see that God is good. God is good. He is a good God. And this is a difficult concept, I think, for a lot of people to understand. I think it's a difficult concept for some people to grasp, a lot of times based on maybe how you were raised. Um, maybe preconceptions you brought in to your faith, even when, even if you are someone who at one point gave your life to Jesus, and you and you accepted He forgave your sins, and and you came to that terms and that, that just changed your life. Even even many people I've talked to like that, they still struggle with this idea that God is good. They they struggle with the idea that God wants good for them. They kind of have in the back of their mind that God is kind of always looking out to punish them, right? I always picture for people who struggle with this, I kind of picture them as seeing God as kind of like that overzealous policeman, right? That overzealous policeman, maybe with a billy club in his hand, you know, and he's just kind of sitting there waiting for someone to mess up, right? They're, you know, he's not just like a normal police officer who who he gets his job is to, you know, protect and also can see things and kind of go, well, it's, uh, you know, it's probably not even worth the time. He's not that guy. He's that guy that just is waiting for someone to mess up, the smallest mess up, right? And and be able to nail him. Is that, I caught you, right? And there are a lot of people that kind of see God like that. And as a result, they don't want to fully turn their life over to him. You know, I know a lot of Christians, it's like, well, I believe in God and I trust Jesus. I trust he died for my sins, but I pretty much want to live my life as I want to live it. I want to keep control over my life because if I fully give it to God, he might really mess with it. I kind of like my life the way it is right now, and I don't want him messing with it because if he messes with it, he might not give me the good things that I really want. So we hold on. Well, let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 32. It says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also... I'm sorry, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Hear what he's saying? God gave us his son. He went through the through the, the strongest possible limits to show us his goodness by giving us his son. And he's saying, how can we trust him that he would do that and then also not trust us to graciously give us good in our life? He graciously gives us all things, all things that we need. See, it doesn't, it doesn't say that we can earn them. It doesn't say that if we do enough and we, and we show enough merit, God will graciously give us a couple things. It doesn't say that. It says with no merit on our own, he gives us good things. And I think that's something we, some of us really need to dig into our heads and then make sure that gets implanted. In Exodus chapter 33, let's look at that verse. In verse 18, it says, Moses said, please show me your glory. So, so Moses wants to know God more. So he says, God, show me your glory. And look what 
God says, and he said, I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. But notice what is he said, he'll show him. What does Moses want to see? He wants to see his glory. But what does God say he'll show him? My goodness. See, God says, look, you want to know me? I'm going to show you my goodness. I think it's interesting that of all the things that God could have shown Moses, he chose to show him his goodness. Jesus tells us just how good he is, just how good the Father is in Luke chapter 11. Let's look at Luke chapter 11, verse 10. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? See, what Jesus is saying is, if we know how to give good things to our kids, and, and yet we struggle with evil thoughts, we have, we have evil hearts, you know, we're going to look later, we're, Jesus says, no one is good but the Father. Right? And we know how to bless our children. We know how to love our children to, to give good things to them. <coughs> Why do we doubt that God would give us good things? See, the scripture says that God wants to bless his children and give them good gifts. He desires to see good things in our lives. He desires to give us what we need and what we want. However, the scripture also says that God is a jealous God, right? That, that he, he's jealous for our hearts. And, you know, as a dad, the more I've grown as a dad, the more I understand that. That the more I understand that, you know, as I pour into my children and I love my children and I want great things for my children, I become angered when I see things start to capture their hearts that I know are going to lead to negative things in their life. See, I want what's best, what's good for them. And I want to give them good things, but guess what? What I want to give them as they're growing up, it's always exactly what they're asking for, isn't it? Only parents get this, right? No, it's almost never what they're asking for, honestly, right? The, the things I want for them is, I would say, probably more than half the time is not actually what they're asking for. What they're asking for, I know in my heart, is more often than not, probably not going to be a good thing for them. Right? It, 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 I, they need other things. Or maybe what they're asking for is good in moderation, but I need to help them understand the limits of it. And help them understand that taking it too far is only dangerous for them. I was just, I was thinking about this one this week, um, especially having all the kids around. And uh, so I've, I've got a uh, nine-month-old, someone's probably going to correct me how old Oakley is. But anyway, I got a nine-month-old granddaughter um, and a two-year-old granddaughter. I like the when they get to years because then I'm pretty, you know, two. I don't know about what eight months she is, but she's two. Two-year-old granddaughter. And we have got the older kids. <clears throat> you know, well, the nine month old, she's crawling, right? So she's just around the house. Like, it's, you know, you put her down and she like disappears. And sure enough, almost every time you find her, she's got something her, like sticking it in her mouth. And, and you, and so you run and you look and sure enough, about half the time, it's something there's no, she should not have it. And not only should she shouldn't have it, it probably could hurt her. So what do you do? You start digging in her mouth and she's like pushing she don't and shake turning her head doing everything she can to keep that in her mouth no i want it right and you as the parent are saying no that's not good let's get rid of that and then when you take that from her what does she do she says 
thank you so much. I, I wasn't understanding this was going to be harmful for me. And I bless you. No, she doesn't do that, right? But she screams. Right? Then I got the, we got the two-year-old granddaughter. We got, a, we got a stove right in the middle of the house. I put a screen around it, right? So she can't touch it. That's not my choice. That's my wife's. I feel like you move that thing. She touches that stove once. Game over. I don't want to deal with it anymore. But my wife wants this, this thing around it. Why? Because we know that's not good for her. It's not going to bless her. But where does she want to go all the time? She wants to go and look. And it's pretty. It's cool. Right? So we do our best to keep her from it. Now, does she walk around going, hey, Pa, I just want to thank you for protecting me from this. I know that that's dangerous for me. And I, I know that I keep being drawn to dangerous things. But, but you understand. And because you understand, you look out for me. And I really appreciate you. No. But she gets mad and she yells at us sometimes and, and wants to fight with us about it. <coughs> Kids get older, right? I got a 10-year-old. She, if, if, if we didn't say anything, she would just let us put food next to her and play Roblox. I don't know if you guys know what this is. It's a, it's a, a video game. She would just play this video game all day. That's what she would love to do. Just play this video game all day, maybe taking a break every now and then to go do something else. But for the most part, that's what she wants to do. We know that that's not good for her. We know she needs to learn to do other things. We know that doctors have shown over and over again the negative effects of too much screen time for kids. We, we know that unmonitored screen times for kids not only... Is it, is it bad about some of the games are playing too long? But you don't know. Once they're on the internet, we don't know what, what all, everything can be happening and who, who's talking to them and all that kind of stuff. So we know she needs to be monitored, right? How often does she thank us, right? And say, man, I just, I know you're watching out for my heart to make sure nobody abuses or misuses me or, or steals my innocence. And that, I, that means so much to me. No, she doesn't do that. She constantly wants to fight. For more time. She constantly wants to tell us about all her friends. Incidentally, all of you give your kids more screen time than we do, I guess, because that's what she tells me every time. Um, <coughs> um, the, the, all her friends get more screen time than we give. Then they get to be teenagers, right? And they want to go wherever they want to go. And they don't want us to ask questions. Where are you going? I don't know. When time are you going home? When I get back. Right? That's what they, that's what they want. And they don't want us asking why. Because they, they, they want to do what, what they want and go where they want to go. Now, why do we ask these questions? Because we know that they can get themselves in situations where they're going to be too afraid to say no. We know they can get themselves in situations where they're going to be misused or mistreated or hurt. And so we do our best to protect them, right? And almost every weekend they come and they say, Mom and Dad, I just want to thank you for putting boundaries on me. Because I know that you understand those boundaries keep me from harm. No. See, in their heads, we don't want to give them good things. Now, hopefully, as they grow through each of those stages, they look back and they, they thank you for the good things you gave. But at the time, they don't understand it as goodness. They don't understand it as you giving them, them what is good for them. And unfortunately, as adults, we very rarely understand God's goodness when he's giving it to us. We, we, are we any different? Right? We want some, I wanted to get this. God, God's like, that'd be awesome for you to own that. But you know what? I also know that debt causes more divorce in America than anything else. I also know that it causes stress and anxiety for you to be into debt. So let me help you learn how to handle your finances and, and learn that when you're a giver, it helps you to, be, to, to have my perspective on it. No, God, you just want my money, right? <laughs> right? This is my allowance, <laughs> right? That's how we see it, right? We, we with so many different issues. We live in a culture that wants to tell us that uh, the God who doesn't just allow you to express your sexuality however you want is, is, is an arrogant God. And he's just trying to be a killjoy. When, when God created it to be good, 
God wants that to be a beautiful, wonderful, exciting, fun part of our lives. But he also knows how it's supposed to be met, work. And he knows when it's used in the wrong ways, it creates all sorts of baggage. It creates all sorts of pain. It, get, it, it cr- cr- creates all sorts of abuse in people's lives. Right? So he has ways he wants it to be used. Because he doesn't want us to enjoy sex? No. Because he wants us to enjoy the way it's meant to be enjoyed. Because he knows, guess what? He wrote it. So he knows how it's meant to be used. See, God is good. He gives good things. And yet it's really hard in the midst of what we're going through to see it as good. So we fight him with all of our baggage and all of our fights and all of our rebellion and all of our getting mad and all of our uh, getting upset when we don't get get our way. And with all of our sin, God still looks down on us and he desires to do good for us. See, for many of us, for one reason or another, though, that's a foreign concept. It's hard for us to really get. Jesus said in Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 10, he said this. He says, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Look at what Jesus says. Jesus said, and why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know, here's what I want you to get from that. God's goodness is it's who he is. See, Jesus is saying God is the pinnacle of goodness. Not only is God just good, it's who he is. There, no one can come up with good better than God. And yet, it's so tough for us to see. I want to just share the rest of our time talking about two ways that I believe God shows goodness. Now, these are just two key ways. They're not the only ways, <clears throat> but hopefully help us understand a little bit of his goodness. First is mercy. God shows his goodness through mercy. Now, well, here's what you need to understand. God is merciful. He doesn't just have mercy. Okay, you understand this. God is merciful. He doesn't just have mercy. He doesn't run out of mercy. He has always been merciful. In fact, a lot of people think this is kind of something, a newer quality of God. I hear people talk about, well, I like the New Testament God. It's just the Old Testament God I don't like. Same God. Same God. God is unchanging. In fact, did you know that the Old Testament talks of God's mercies four times more than in the New Testament? Four times more than the Old Testament talks about mercy. Than the, than the New Testament. Let me just give you an example. Um, you know, we talk about how God, you know, like, well, you see the destruction and things God did in the Old Testament. First of all, you have to understand, this was over thousands of years that God did this, of warning people. Warning people, you need to change. You need to repent. Please, please, doing everything you can, sending prophets that they would just kill. Saying, Follow what I've told you. And we're not just talking about like just random people. These are people, for the most part, that he had set out and said, you're, look, we agree, you're going to be my people, right? That You're going to follow me. I'm going to take care of you. They would say, yeah, we're going to do that. But God, we like this stuff better, right? And he kept reaching out to him. Look, at, we see just a piece of this in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. <clears throat> he says this. He says, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? See, he's saying, please, please come back. See, God is part of God's, who God is, he gives us free will. I mean, can you imagine your three-year-old playing in the freeway? But you had the you you had the limited ability. You you couldn't just reach out and grab that three year old and get him out of the harm. 
and pleading with them and crying with them, screaming to them to get out of the highway and come back to safety and them ignoring you the whole time. And then when they get hit, them blaming you and saying what an angry, horrible parent you are. You see, it, it doesn't make sense, but that's what we try to do with God. We say, no, he, he, he's angry. He just wants to cause pain and destruction. But no, he pleads with us. And we'll get back to the limiting at part in just a minute. God's mercy will never change. It'll never go away. It won't cease to exist. It's infinite. It's everlasting. You know, we get, we get angry at injustice, don't we? I don't know about you. I do. I see injustice in this world, and I get angry at it. I want God to fix it. I want him to deal with it. But we, we want God to kind of have a double standard. See, when it comes to me and the things I do wrong, when it comes to me and my sins, when it comes to me and the things I have been unjust about, and when it comes to my loved ones, I want God to show mercy. I want him to be merciful to me because I know what I deserve. I know what I've done in my life. But when it comes to others, I want God to show justice. When it comes to those who have hurt me or hurt my loved ones, I want God to show justice. When it comes to those who, who their atrocities are a little bit stronger than my atrocities, I want God to show justice. See, God shows the same mercy to the abusers and murderers that he shows to us. They're recipients of it. We're all recipients of God's mercy, but his justice will come. And it will, and only those who rely on his mercy through the cross of Christ will escape it. He will bring justice, but, but it will come on his time. And only when we rely on the cross of Christ will any of us escape it. Look at 2 Peter 3, 8 through 10. Now, dear friends, do not let this one thing escape your notice. That a single day is like a thousand years with the Lord. And a thousand years is like a single day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some regard slowness, slowness, but it being patient towards you because he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And when it comes, the heavens will disappear with horrific noise and the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze and the earth and every deed done on it will be laid bear. See, God is merciful towards all. He wants all to come to him. However, he is also just. And those that do not choose to come to him will feel his justice. See, in his goodness, God doesn't control us. Remember I said, as that parent who can't go out on the highway, I, I know in our, a lot of our minds, it's like, well, why doesn't God just jump out on the highway? Because the moment he does, you have no free will. And I don't know about you, but I want my free will to make the choices I make. I don't want to be a robot. Sure, I want him to make murderers robots. I want him to make them do what, exactly what he, they should do. But me, my sins aren't that bad. Let's, let's let those alone, God. See, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Either he's going to give us free will or he's not. And, but it's someday he's going to bring justice. And only those who rely on him will escape that justice. Romans eleven twenty two 22 says this. <coughs> Consider, oh, I'm sorry, note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. You see, the writer of Romans goes through this all over and over again. 
that God is merciful he's, and gracious, but he's also just, and he will bring his justice. Another way that God shows his goodness is through grace. God shows his goodness through grace. See, while mercy is the withholding of judgment and justice, Grace is the gifting to those who don't deserve it. See, through his mercy, he doesn't show judgment right now. He allows us to live, even no matter what atrocities we're doing. But through grace, he gives us the gift that we don't deserve. See, once again, this is another one that people oftentimes mistake as a New Testament concept. But God is unchanging. And now in the New Testament, it's more of a pertinent um, theme because it's a centra- the New Testament is the centrality of the teaching of the New Testament is on the cross. And so the uh, grace is spoken of all the time in the New Testament. However, it's not a new concept. Char- grace is a characteristic of God as with mercy and is no more or less prevalent in God before or after the cross. See, grace is and always has been the way to salvation. See, if the law showed us anything, the law only showed us that no one was, can be, or ever will be saved through the law. Nobody. Everybody broke the law. There was was nobody that could live up to it. See, just like mercy, God's grace has no bounds, no degrees. He is simply fully gracious to everyone who will receive it. And through God's grace, God offers every single one of us a chance to live with him. Not one of us deserves it. Like Chad kind of said in this video, none of us deserves it. None of us are good good enough. None of us can earn it. But grace is what allows God to offer it to us anyway. See, Jesus and the sacrifice on the cross, it was accumulation of grace to us. Even before the cross, before the cross, it was constantly looking forward towards it. And after the cross, we are constantly looking back on it. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Right? They're pointing to this righteousness. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, just as mercy is the counterpart to justice, grace is the counterpart to righteousness. See, some, there are those that would say, well, if God is so good, I can't believe in hell. I can't believe in a good God that would create a hell. But God is good, but he's also righteous. And therefore, Anyone who chooses not to receive his covering, who chooses not to submit and listen and and receive the one gift they they need, he's not going to make them do it. He won't make us receive that gift. So therefore, we can can choose to live out of his presence. We can choose to live out our eternity outside his presence. If that's our choice, he will not make us do it. All we need to do is receive his covering. All we need to do is receive that gift. But he will not make someone do it. God's goodness is culminated in all his qualities. None of them overpowers or cancels out the other. He is gracious. He is merciful. But he is just. And he is righteous. And all these things work together for his good. I just want to close by asking you to just think through this. 
Do you struggle trusting the goodness of God? Do you struggle trusting that God wants good for you? Do you trust that he would give his son as the greatest gift? And that all you need to do is receive that gift. And once you receive that gift, hopefully you will open your heart to him and trust him more and more. Because it's a process. I know when I first gave my life to Christ, there were still many, many things I wanted to hold back from him that I didn't trust him with, that I thought somehow he'd mess up if I let him have them. But it's a continual process, continually asking ourselves, can we give it over to him? We'll never fully be able to describe all the qualities of God to make sense of them completely. The moment we do, God is not big enough to worship. But can we trust that he is a good God and he desires good gifts for his children? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are good. I thank you that you desire good for us. And yet, God, I know that we struggle trusting that. God, oftentimes we're like those little kids or the teenage kids, whatever it is where, where we... We just know we want something, we want it now. Or we think we're somehow going, we're, we're, they were more rational than you. And if you would just listen to us, it would work out better. And it's hard to just trust you. So God, I just pray that you would give us hearts to trust you. You would help us to just turn it all over into your hands. Pray these things in Jesus' name. I spoke a word you were singing over me. You've been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. So, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, beats a 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't. Till you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Whoa. When I was your foe I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all. So Oh,
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up Nothing you won't climb up Coming after me Thank you for joining us today. We just want to let you know we'll be praying for you and we hope you have a wonderful week.